Thank you to all the supporters of HMS Unicorn who made this online talk possible. If you would like to support the work of HMS Unicorn, then please head to www.hmsunicorn.org.uk and donate. Falls of Clyde, Past, Present and Future Guest Speaker David O'Neill Falls of Clyde was the first of eight ships all carrying the name of the historic landmark waterfalls in Scotland. Built by Russell and Co. at their Bay Shipyard in Port Glasgow in 1878, she was designed as a bulk carrier. Currently based in Honolulu and listed as a US national landmark, she is now the only surviving four-masted iron-hulled Clyde-built tall ship that is still afloat. David O'Neill, a Gorbals native and member of Falls of Clyde International, tells the story of the ship and what the future may hold. There we go. I hope that you can all see that now. Um, again, my details, but also at the bottom there, if there's any further information that you feel I've missed out on, uh, the website details are at the bottom. You can catch up there on the, the plans for the ship and the history of the ship. And you can submit requests and you can even make a donation if you want. So let's move on. Oh. There we go. Um, the Falls of Clyde, actually one of the last of the iron built four masted cargo ships uh, built on the Clyde. And she was built in Port Glasgow in 1878, launched on the 12th of December. Um, the bottom left there, you can see an aerial picture of Port Glasgow. And you can see a little sort of bay dockyard area. Well, that's the slipways where the Falls of Clyde was built. Now, today, that is just a park that's filled in, and Ferguson Marine is on the outside edge of that pier, and they now occupy that space. We have a good relationship with Ferguson's because they became part owners in the Russell Company later on. Uh, she was the first of eight ships to bear the name, um, all named after Scottish waterfalls. Unfortunately, she is the only survivor, the rest having been lost either in either World War or lost at sea. Um, she is a very large vessel for her age, I suppose, and her size. She was manufactured for Wright and Breckenridge uh, of Union Street, Glasgow, £18,000 it cost them, which by today's money doesn't seem a lot, but um, in those days I'm sure it was. She was all wrought iron ribs and frames with 11 and 16 inch almost an inch plating. Um, unfortunately, that plating is not so thick these days. 1,700 tons, 266 feet by 40. The records tend to vary on that, give or take three or four feet, but that's what we're going with at the moment. E extensive hold capacity of 23 feet deep by the 40 feet width, as you can imagine. She was built to carry bulk cargoes long distance. Um, for those days, an average crew of 39, but by today's standards and where we are hoping to go with her, uh, quite a large crew there. Maiden voyage was to Karachi in 1879. She was launched on the 12th of December, 1878. And literally a month later was when she set sail. Not like today when they launched the, the, the shell of the vessel, if you like, and then there's another year or two fitting out. These vessels were manufactured as was, and almost within a month, uh, she was away on her maiden voyage to Karachi, carrying the cargo of his um, Excuse me. She, she carried on those kind of routes extensively for 20 years, but by the end of that 20 year period, as you see, she had done all, she'd covered almost 350,000 miles to all the continents in the world. And we have, a, we have an extensive list of all of the ports and in some cases, some of the cargoes that she actually carried at the time. Um, in 1898, uh, Wright and Reckonridge sold her to William Matson's, which was to become Matson Shipping. Now, today, they're one of the largest, if not the largest, shipping company in the Eastern Pacific, um, based in Honolulu, but extensively operationed throughout the United States. And it wasn't quite straightforward, but Mr. Matson, who was an immigrant from Sweden, he bought the vessel. Uh, he paid $55,000 for her. But to get her to work in the United States, he needed permissions, 
because she was a, a non-American vessel and it took a special act of Congress for the Falls of Clyde to be able to operate in the United States waters and ports. Um, Matson Shipping, as I said, has gone on to become one of the largest shipping companies um, in the Pacific and probably in the world, actually. And he had plans for her. Now, she was built as a clipper, but he wanted to convert her and he converted her to be a bark. And he spent $15,000 converting the ship to reduce her manageability, if you like, with a smaller crew. And she was now then able to operate with 12 crew. So quite a difference from 39. From his perspective as an operator, saves a lot of money. Um, in 1907, um, she was fitted with tanks. Um, he seen that there was a lucrative market. Initially, the falls had been carrying sugar, bags of sugar from Honolulu to San Francisco. That was the main route that she operated on um, under mats and control. And then, actually, the falls, just an interesting point, I only learned the other day. The Falls of Clyde actually was one of the, she was the ship that delivered the first locomotive to Hawaii. Um, now that says a lot about the uh, cargo capacity. And additionally, she was also the first ship to deliver an automobile to Hawaii as well. Yeah, there's a lot more of them there nowadays, that's for sure. Um, so he recognised there was a market for oil and the US mainland oil that had been dis discovered extensively. Texas, California, the oil companies were growing. The need for oil was growing. So he's seen an opportunity not only to carry on with sugar, but to then transport sugar and molasses from Hawaii to San Francisco. And what they then did is when they offloaded the cargoes in San Francisco, they would clean out the tanks, fill them up with oil, and then transport the oil potentially with um, passengers. I think at one point she carried up to 55 passengers, but she, she took immigrants from the mainland to the islands and obviously vice versa. As you see, she could carry 19,000 barrels of oil and then on the lower deck that was left, uh, 1,200 drums of 100 gallons each. Um, and the next slide will actually show you a bit of the layout. Um, and, and as I said earlier, the main uh, cargoes there and during her life with um, Matson's were sugar, molasses, oil and passengers. San Diego, I believe, was also included in other northwest cities, but th that was the main route that she served. Uh, there's an example there of the Matson flag, one, a, a, a copy of which is actually still flying, albeit a bit tattered from the ship at the moment in the harbour. The black and white image you see is her in the dry dock where she's having the tanks uh, fitted and obviously some passengers. This was an example of the layout change. So instead of just being an open bulk carrier with large twin deck and lower deck, um, they fitted tanks down each side of the ship. Literally, there were five large tanks. I think they're about 30 feet by 10, approximately each. And that included the whole infrastructure that was required of um, pumps, heating systems, so that the oil could be heated to make it uh, um, flow easier for offloading and loading, and various changes were made to deck cabins and uh, the front of the vessel with the queue. The crew used to sleep, but they now had a deck house, so touch a luxury there for them. But uh, this is how she looks just now. In fact, this image is one of the few remaining drawings of the Falls of Clyde because many of the originals were all destroyed in an air raid, I believe, in World War II. So there is very little information from the original diagrams available. We have this and we have a cutaway um, profile of the hull itself um, in, in, in half quarter. And there is another one, but I'll come back to that later. After Matson, she had a bit of a mixed ownership life. 1921, she was sold to Standard Oil because again, the oil market was growing dramatically. Um, the little diagram on the left-hand side is to show the legacy companies of Standard Oil who are still operational today. So Exxon, Chevron, BP and Marathon, all the way back through their family tree, came from Standard Oil, the former owner of the Falls of Clyde. She was even used in advertising at one point. If you see there in the middle um, image, 50 years at sea, this raw iron vessel is unarmed by corrosion. That was from a company called Rustolium, 
who are also uh, still around today. I've reached out to them to ask if they want to get involved and perhaps provide some rust proofing material, but they've not responded favourably. Let's put it that way, but maybe they, they don't like heritage, but we can but try. On the right there is an image of what she looked like in the late 60s, but we'll come on to that. In 1921, as I said, the Standard Oil Company took control of her. She was derigged um, and then taken after, after that life in the oil sector and taken to Alaska, where she was used as a, a fuel barge by the Alaska Packers Company. Um, her working career was really over at that point because she then sat in Alaska for many, many years. Um, always loaded down to the waterline, below the between deck level almost, um, packed with oil, uh, sorry, fuel for the fishing fleets of um, Alaska. Her real career, even as a, as a, a barge hulk, came to an end in the 50s. Um, she was towed to Seattle, where it was hoped that she could become an attraction, but Plans, plans sometimes don't always work out, but uh, there was good intention at that point to save the ship even then. Um, then through, thanks to uh, a journalist called Bob Krause, um, he's actually written a book as well, which there are only a few copies of, 324 days of, of voyages under sail. Um, we hope to have some copies of that to be able to offer to supporters later on. And Bob managed to get the funding together through public appeals and public money and other, other, other pots of gold that were lying around in tech, I suppose you could call it. Um, the rebuild was started on the Falls of Clyde at that point, And by 1973, she had been opened in Hawaii um, and then became part of the public exhibition at the Hawaii Maritime Museum in 1984 and was a great success. Many hundreds of thousands of people had visited the ship. And when I was over in Hawaii um, to look at the ship and met the people who are looking after her just now, I, was, I had all sorts of stories about how over that period since the 1970s, practically every kindergarten or school, primary school as we would call it in Hawaii, their kids had spent the night or had visited the Falls of Plight. So they either had a sleepover or they'd been to the, uh, the ship for a, a bit of pirate fun, I suppose, from a kid's perspective. So she does, while she's in difficulties at the moment, she she has a lot of history that many Hawaiians um, are fond of and, and share, but unfortunately, the recent past, many people have become disillusioned by the behaviour of various authorities, um, but also the fact that funding hasn't been available and the ship has deteriorated over a number of years. Um, from present day perspective, again, we've got some images here of the ship that I took when I was over. Um, in 2008, a community charity was formed called the Friends of Falls of Clyde. And they, were, they are the present day owners effectively. And they have been looking after the ship with some funding, some public support, um, from the general public rather than public funding. And they had some funding that was left over um, from the original, what I could just calling a dowry, to maintain and look after the ship. Um, but then up till about 2016, they did the, the best they could. Funds were running out. They had some major expenditure in the 80s when she was out the water to have the hull cleaned. And trust me, it desperately needs it again. Um, but the DOT, Department of Transport, got a bit impatient because unfortunately the permit ran out, which was the prime reason that the Harbours Authority then impounded the ship, <coughs> excuse me, which is a common practice. It wasn't unique to the Falls of Clyde for any reason. Um, but then <coughs> later on, there were issues around unpaid harbour fees and the potential of insurance cover um, because she was a liability. She's occupying a, a valuable location in downtown Honolulu. Uh, that building you see in the, the, local, the, the bottom photograph behind her, that is the former Mari um, Maritime Heritage Centre that she was part of. They've gone into liquidation, that's completely closed now. So from a harbour's perspective, they're looking to generate the area again. Um, they're not prepared to make the investment into the ship and they would like her moved as much as they possibly can uh, or get rid of her basically, they, they don't care. Now, they have put together plans to dispose of the ship at sea, 
um, which means scuttling the ship in a, a prearranged area offshore. Well, they have done it before. Um, but to do that, they have to get permissions from the Environmental Protection Agency, the US Coast Guard, the Native Hawaiian Heritage Department, and the National Park Service in Washington, DC, because she is a US national listed landmark. Yep, I understand why were the, why, why are they allowing a listed landmark to be disposed of? Well, it turns out they weren't, and I'll come on to that later on. <coughs> So, as you can see, she's in a bit of a state. Um, she needs some extensive work. She needs a full rebuild. Now, she is still at risk. That is the issue. She is on the UK National Register of Historic Ships as a, a British ship overseas at risk. But unfortunately, we won't qualify for any assistance financially from the UK National Lottery Fund until she is back in UK waters. So our priority is to get her home um, and through the plans that we'll come on to, we'll try and raise the funding that we intend to raise. We have uh, um, many agreements with in-kind support um, to provide the services and support we need to make this operation possible. Um, some of which we're paying for, some of which we're not, but we can come on to that later. So as I said, the ship is still at risk. And obviously it's a priority that we do something about it. So the lifeline of my story here with the ship is how did I become involved? And that is simply social media, the power of social media. In 2015, there was a post put up by a gentleman called Robert Parker. Got to know Robert quite well eventually. We had many late night talks because of the time differences, as you can imagine. And Robert filled me in on the, the previous 10 years of management of the ship and difficulties that they had, and the local psyche and attitude towards the ship and the difficulties that the present group were experiencing in trying, in trying to stimulate fresh support uh, and investment, uh, because she had lost her shine effectively, um, and they wanted to restore her back to that. So I became involved with a view to helping them in Hawaii to work with them um, to bring a global focus towards the Falls of Clyde staying in Hawaii um, and being restored there. But after a while, I realized that from my perspective, I come from uh, a business to business sales environment. Um, and and I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty creative and imaginative on how I managed to open doors to talk to decision makers. Unfortunately, the committee and the people in Honolulu who were looking after the ship had different opinions from myself on how we should be doing it what we should be asking for and how we should be asking for it. So at that point, I decided, look, I'm, I'm going to step back now and create a new group called Falls of Clyde International, which is where we are now. But we work in, in conjunction with them. They, they're aware of what we're trying to do. They know our mission. They know what we're trying to achieve and they support it. And But before we went down that road, we had to decide is this possible? Is it possible to save this ship? We had the survey reports that had been provided by the Friends of Falls of Clyde. Um, they, they weren't as in-depth as we could have done with, but they were still informative enough that we could reach a decision that there looks like there's enough durability left in the ship that she could be restored and strengthened. Um, so we looked around for a bit of inspiration to find out, has anybody else done something like this? And as you see, the example that we came up with is a vessel called the James Craig, built in Tyne and Weir in 1877. So she's a year older, sorry, two, yeah, a year older than the Falls of Clyde. And she was originally called the Clan MacLeod, how apt, again, another Scottish name. And as you see, there was a, a look at the condition of her. That floating hulk is the way that a gentleman called Maury Flatman, who's a naval architect, and um, he got a team together and they plugged the holes in her. She was actually, that's her floating. She was submerged and had been submerged for about 40 years, probably I think up till about deck level. Um, but she was burnt out. They deliberately hold her and sunk her. And as I said, Maury in the late 1980s and his team, they patched the holes up, pumped her out and she floated. <laughs> and wow. And uh, the other two images show the extensive replating they had to do. You can see there that 
well, as I understand it now, about 80% of the plating was taken off at that level below um, that line you see on that left hand side. And extensive structural work was done to, to the vessel. On the right hand side, that is the James Craig today. She sails around the waters of, of Australia. Um, many people enjoy the ship. They, I think they do sail training, um, but she's a living proof and proof of concept of what can be done. So from my perspective, here is the inspiration for the Falls of Clyde. But additionally, there is also the Elisa in Galveston, Texas. When you look at that story of the work there, they went to Greece, they had a hulk, they plugged the holes, they replated where they could, they patched her up, they got permissions to bring her back via Gibraltar back to the United States. And the Elisa looks very similar to the James Craig now. Um, and she has occasional sales in the Gulf. I know she took part last year in some tall ships meetings off the East Coast, um, but fully operational. So again, we're seeing a pattern here of vessels that are in a tragic state. And if anything, the Falls of Clyde is actually not as bad as these two vessels were. Um, the fact is she's still afloat and, and unaided. There are no pumps running. Um, there are pumps for pumping out excess water, which comes from rainwater running through the decks because of, there's holes in various places on the decks. But otherwise, I had no proof of concept that this could be done. So we set about that task. But before we did that, we decided that we don't just want to bring back another old ship because we might not be able to put her back to see the way these guys have done. So what is this in that? What do we do with her or we don't? So the obvious thing is that she becomes another exhibit. We already have an exhibit of a tall ship on the Clyde called the Glen Lee. Stunning example, beautiful ship, um, built in the same shipyard um, as the Falls of Clyde, only a number of years later when it was under different management. And there are paddle steamer Waverly here, the world's last ocean going paddle steamer that sails up all around the United Kingdom. And there is the Queen Mary project, which is an, another amazing project. Now, not the Queen Mary that many of you might think of in Long Beach, California, but the original turbine passenger steamer that was on the Clyde. And we thought, well, if we're bringing another ship back just to be a static exhibit, it's, it's going to become a drain on resources. It's going to become um, either, a, 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 not only a drain to a, any of the organizers that look after her, but with other examples in the UK, it tends to be the public purse that bails ships out, that helps them lottery funding, which is a good thing on its own, and we intend to look at that as well once she's back. But we didn't want to choose a route that meant that we would be attracting government money, um, or the, for the, particularly for the first phase of the project, from the general public. So we then had to look at, if she's going to come back and be a static, right, let's look at how she pays for herself then. But on the other hand, if she can be put back to sea in the manner of the James Craig and the Elisa. We, we, need, we need to look at a lot of areas, as you say, operational um, and rebuild costs. From an operational perspective, what we've done is talk to tall ship groups around the world uh, to assess their operational annual running costs to give us an average to work with on what we might expect to have to outlay to run the ship as a seagoing vessel each year. Um, we were approached by a Dutch company called Fair Transport Europe, who are the leaders, as far as I'm concerned, in fair trade cargo transportation under sail. A gentleman called Arken van der Veen contacted me when we first announced that we were trying to save the Falls of Clyde. And Arken and I spoke, and I was, I was a bit curious because I'm still thinking of this as a, a heritage type project. And, excuse me. I said to Arkin, you know, what, what, what's your interest in the Falls of Clyde? He said, David, we do, we do cargo and this is what he does and he explained it all to me. And that, that's actually his ship on the right, uh, the Tres Hombres. He's got two, but that's the, excuse me, the Tres Hombres, uh, which the Tres Hombres is three friends, I think that, that means. Um, and they've been transporting cargo from Caribbean, South America, around Europe, and now they're doing South of North America. Um, and they're picking up cargoes from ethical producers 
and they're bringing them back to to Amsterdam. They're then distributing those goods from there around Europe and to the UK. They can only carry 50 tonnes of cargo. So he explained that the obvious attraction to them for the Falls of Clyde is the cargo capacity. Um, she was built and she, well, I suppose designed for up to 2,000 tonnes cargo, but from the historical records, we know that there was one journey where she was carrying nearly 4,000 tonnes allegedly, uh, allegedly on, on a journey. So I could see then why fair trade cargo made sense, because is it the scale is to scale up the operation with a bigger ship bringing bigger cargoes means lower prices. Therefore, the price to the end user is greater, you get greater sales, and that in turn boosts the whole business. So Arkin then asked if he would like to be involved, and yeah, well, once, once he gave me the arithmetic on the cost of the cargo per nautical mile to deliver that cargo that we would get paid, yeah, I thought, okay, this is interesting. So that was one option, was fair trade cargo. So what we were looking for were, are there any more? Are there other options that we could work the ship at sea that would provide a sustainable living to pay for the ship and the operations that we had and the costs. So fair trade cargo was there, that was the first one. And it was actually the most beneficial in, in turnover, if you like. Um, we are still talking to Arkin and Co and other to other tow ship groups like that around Europe in particular, Northern Europe. And there's a great project where in Central America at the moment, Costa Rica, where there is a ship being built from new, made of wood, timber ship. She will carry, I believe, I think it might be 100 tonnes or 500 tonnes-ish of cargo still under construction. Again, the whole ethos is about ethical cargoes, not only from the farmer's perspective, but about the transportation and the oceans and protecting uh, the life in the oceans. Uh, and of course, not having emissions um, from engines on ships. Um, the other sector we looked at was sail training and education at sea. And many organisations do this, like Picton Castle, or the Golden Lear has been doing it for many years um, with an organisation in Canada. Um, one of our team actually served five and a half months on board the Golden Lear during a, a, an education at sea programme. And he, worked, he, was, he was actually a UK registered nurse, and that's why he was on board. And he worked with, I believe, up to 40 kids on board between the ages of 15 and 18. And these kids were there um, because they were very fortunate that their parents could afford to, to pay the fee, which was, what we think now, 35,000 euros per head or 56,000 euros per 10 month semester uh, with a break in between. And on board, they get standard education um, in the sciences, mathematics, etc. But what they also get is the character building life experiences of working on a tall ship, traveling around various parts of the world. On that occasion that our colleague was on board, it was um, on the Atlantic Rim from Montevideo to Tristan de Cunha, Cape Town, St. Helena, Ascension Island, just off Brazil, then the Caribbean Islands, and then up to Halifax, Nova Scotia. And that took five and a half months. And the guy that actually went on that program was looking for something in life. He just he wasn't happy with his lot, let's put it that way. Hated working in our NHS and was looking for a bit of adventure. He came back with a grin from there to there and a beard halfway down his belly. And the belly had gone that he had previously, which was quite interesting. Uh, and told me many stories of seeing the constellations under the stars at night, pollution, light pollution free, um, of flying fish, of swimming with whale sharks, um, turtles, as you see there, that's a negative part, we'll come on to that. So when we looked at the arithmetic around education at sea and sail training, um, relative to our running cost that we had anticipated, now going back to that slightly, from the, what, the, the tall ship groups around the world that we had spoken to, they all gave us an estimate of their annual running costs. So we took an average from that for the falls applied relative to her size and comparison. And we came up with an annual cost of $1.5 million as a running cost alone. So that's why each of these operations, either on its own or, or with two of them together, we're looking for that to provide the funding to, to run the ship. 
Um, the rebuild part we'll come on to later on. So sale training, education at sea. Now each of them are separate. Sale training would be a relationship with a college or a university, either in the United Kingdom, Europe, or in the United States, or further afield. Um, we will be putting feelers out to universities to, to partner with, um, or maritime training colleges that don't have access to a vessel, or especially not a vessel of this type. And so, each, so we've got fair trade cargo, sail training, education at sea. So the other point that, that, that we looked at is, okay, we are looking to fit the ship with clean emission propulsion. Um, how do we how do we play a part with the environment other than the fact that she will be emission free? Now, but the Falls of Clyde at the moment doesn't have an engine. We intend to provide an engine to comply with modern regulations, but we want that engine to be emission free, either through all electric, and we, I'll come on to that again, hydrogen, um, hybrid, um, ammonia, whatever. We are looking at various options and they're being evaluated at the moment. So ocean cleanup as a, a, a protection of the oceans and marine life is important to the programme because that will be part of the educational programme on board is the wider environment, um, the marine environment, the marine life, but also the global environment. And finally from that, sail adventure holidays. So all in all, there are about five or six operations. The, the ocean cleanup part particularly is centering around ghost netting. You see that poor little turtle there tied up in ghost netting. Well, we were approached by a gentleman called Paul Manning. Um, Paul is presently, a, I believe, a CEO, I think. I might have got his title wrong, but he works with an organisation called TEAA, which is the, the extraction... No, I, know, I can't remember what it means now. The Extraction Energy Alliance, I think. Uh, the Energy Extraction Alliance, I think that's it. Anyway, um, Paul approached us um, with a previous hat on from another company some years ago asking if we would consider working as part of ocean cleanup in these days of um, climate change and protecting the environment. And he says, well, what could we do? How do you see us fitting in? And he said, ghost nets. He said, your ship is big enough, you've got cargo holds, um, although that will be reduced once there's a propulsion system on board. And, battery storage. Um, what they were planning is that they would have people with smaller craft that would travel around the routes that we were on, particularly in the Pacific. Um, they would find large sets of ghost netting like that, um, with marine life or not, and we would help the marine life where we could. Um, they would actually put a, a GPS tag on it and then notify us. We then go to that location as part of the educational program the kids then get the hands-on experience of hauling these nets on board, um, releasing any marine creatures that are trapped in amongst them, discussing the whole of the, bio the biology element as much as the environmental element around those, that netting and the damage it's doing. And then we would then take that on arrival in a harbour to a recycling point, which are all pre-arranged through Paul's organisation. So that actually on its, its own, actually, while we get an educational benefit for the kids on board, we actually get paid for that material to recycle it. So each of these areas, including sail adventure holidays. Now, that's aimed at you, you and me, basically, that if you want a holiday with a difference, um, it could be linked either on its own or it could be linked with ocean cleanup. You're looking for a sail adventure holiday. You sign on to the ship, you become a member of the crew or a trainee effectively, and we sail. You get to either, you can climb the masts, lower the sails, lower the anchors, do all the maintenance work on board the ship as well, play a rota, um, or you can just stand back and watch. But as you see for those kids there, I mean, personally, I don't fancy doing that. <laughs> I don't think I could. Um, but it's a fantastic opportunity for those that are looking for that kind of adventure. The Picton Castle, amongst any, many other vessels, do something similar. It's quite a lucrative market in the holiday sector. So we have options here, post-rebuild, of how we can sustain the ship as a seagoing vessel. So that's the thoughts around the future of the Falls of Clyde. I mentioned earlier about climate and climate change. That has been crucial to us because nothing more than a wind ship talks about protecting the environment in today's conversations around 
ship emissions and the damage it does to the environment. So number one for us was a target of we're seeking 100% clean emission propulsion. Now, we're aware of what's out there at the moment. We're aware that there is uh, the various elements that I mentioned before, and there are trial projects going on with small ferries around Europe and elsewhere in the world. And but we're looking at, they all offer an advantage, yes, but what they tend not to have is range and length at the time that they've gotten power, excuse me, not only for propulsion, but for services on board the ship. Many of those types of short range ferries require plugins or updates for fuel after a, a short period of time. Now that's no good for an ocean going vessel. So we put out a challenge that we are looking to the, um, I suppose the engine manufacturing sector and the marine industry to come up with um, solutions. We know that universities and research centers are, around the world are all working on various technologies, the examples I gave earlier. And we put out a challenge that here is a tall ship, a wind ship, a historic ship. We're giving you a blank canvas to come up with a solution, come up with a, a proposal that will give us a, a, not 50%, not 60%, we want 100%, that's our target. And right now, I don't believe, well, I'll come on to one example. Nobody has given us exactly what we need, but there are flows and ebbs and in, in the, in the maneuverings of technologies and trials at the moment going on. But that's great, that's cool for us because we're not likely to require installation anyway for another two, two and a half years. So, so if, it's some, if some projects are being refined at the moment, we can, we can wait and we can work with manufacturers of their solutions. So that's where we have been. Um, we got responses from examples there, our ABB Marine, who are the sponsors of Formula E. So certainly a focus on clean emissions and obviously electric technologies there. MIT Group from South of England, um, they've, they've again offered us an, an electric and then a hybrid type solution. Um, who was the other one? Yeah, Bulldog Energy from the United States came up with a solution for us also. And a company called Seven Synergies, which is an offshoot, I believe, of um, Bulldog Energy. But to me, I'm not a naval architect, I'm not an engineer. These just look like drawings on paper. They don't mean anything to me. They're a flat image with lines and circles and squares and uh, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a naval architect. So we had to call upon help um, we're being offered these technical solutions, but we, we didn't understand them ourselves. So we put a, a call out for advice and help. And Paul Feely, the head of engineering at BAE Systems here on the Clyde, uh, responded to that. And after some dialogue about our plans for the ship coming back to the Clyde, Clyde's his, his heritage on shipbuilding and the fact that they are the last remaining ship, made big shipbuilder on the Clyde. Um, yeah, he was interested and he seen a reason to get involved. So they called upon on their own staff and I believe there is a team of five naval architects and two drivetrain specialists who have been given the proposals that we received to evaluate them. Now a team leader, I believe, um, Anne Madsen from formerly Strathclyde University, she was a lecturer. She, she's actually overseeing that group to look at the systems that are being offered. And they're doing their best in amongst their everyday job, building frigates and warships, um, to look at the Falls of Clyde solution also. So it's great to see um, existing companies today coming forward, companies like BAE getting involved from a heritage, but also it's not, it's not the heritage element. Uh, heritage is a small H at this point, but it's technology with a, a big T as far as we're concerned. And that's the way we're viewing this. We're offering an opportunity to many of these companies to, you know, we're giving you a test bed, a platform, and if it's successful, this ship will travel the world and we will open our doors to companies overseas and say, come and see what can be done. Look at the technologies, look at how we've rebuilt this ship. Clyde built engineering at its best, durability that she's lasted 143 years and that she can be re-engineered on the Clyde and put back to sea with 21st century technologies on board, serving the purposes that we're all aware of. So we obviously thought, right, okay, that's propulsion element, hotel services, Strathclyde University, 
excuse me, Strathclyde University um, final year students put together a, a package on hydrogen production on board the ship, but they also looked at every other aspect, which was the social impact, the environmental impact, the community impact, and a business impact assessment of the, all of the proposals that I, I gave you earlier. Uh, and they passed them with a clean bill of health that they are all very achievable. And that was the right people and the statistici statisticians doing their own work and research into the market further afield. And they concurred with what we felt and what we discovered. So from that survey that they did of that proposal they put together, um, they came up that we required 1500 kilowatts for propulsion and 854 hotel services, heating, air conditioning, fridges, freezers, cooking, that, navigation systems, of course, safety systems, communications. Um, we have received interest from communication companies globally, satellite comms companies. Um, we're still in conversations with two of them at the moment, and we'd like that to hopefully move forward as we move forward with, to that selection of systems. Um, the competition obviously has produced results so that in the interim, um, they're evaluating, but we, we have also put out a competition to naval architects, inviting them to redesign the ship. Because remember I say, this is heritage with a small H, the ship largely will look the same, but internally she will be subdivided in a completely different way to the tanker layout that I gave you earlier on. So, so we are, we're offering naval architects, ideally from my perspective, we would like to offer a young naval architect the opportunity to put his name on the ship so that he can say he designed the Falls of Clyde. He rebuilt her as she sails around the world um, with the various new safety systems and and compartments and, and strengthening that was required. Um, and I think it's a great opportunity for any young budding naval architect. So then we come back to the journey home itself. Now, when we started out down this road, we put an appeal out on LinkedIn and we put a call out to the maritime sector and we put an image up with the ship that you've seen earlier sitting at the museum saying, old Scottish lady needs a lift home, can you help? And then we went on to explain that we're looking for spare capacity in a lift ship, heavy lift ship, semi-submersible or uh, semi-submersible barge. We had tugs operators offering us to tow the ship back um, all the way to Glasgow. That came from the American side and from Amsterdam. Um, I'm sure we'd get it from the UK ultimately if, if we talked to enough people, but at the moment we had those two offers. Now, a company from Oslo came forward called OHT, which I believe is Ocean Heavy Transportation. And after a bit of discussion, there was also three other, four other companies. Two of them were just simply hard cash. That's all they wanted. And it was silly money, silly prices. Um, the, three, uh, the remaining three, two of them, yeah, they still wanted a large element of the cost up front. Um, and then the balance, et cetera, normal commercial contract again, but a more favorable rate. And then the, the final company, OHT. OHT offered that they would com complete the lift operation in one go, point A to point B, Honolulu to Glasgow, and that they didn't want the money up front, but they would do it to help us in the situation that we were faced with, which is that the authorities were threatening to sink the ship. They respected the heritage and also the, the close association that there had been for many years um, since World War II, I believe, and perhaps longer as the association between Norway and Scotland and the UK as a whole. Um, that element came into it as well, which was great to see that other European countries were now offering support. Uh, they're offering as a lift ship, the, dubs, the Dutch are offering as tugs. What more could be asked for? So provisionally, they gave us a, a proposal of 2017 but they would, June, July 2017, they would send a ship. We agreed that because of the fragility of the ship that she could only be moved in harbour. So we needed a ship that was small enough to fit in harbour, submerge, take the Falls of Clyde on board and lift it up. That was the agreement. The ship they were sending, I think, was the Calypso from their range. Um, then they called us a month before to say, we're going to have to postpone this till September because we have a cargo coming to Honolulu, which was perfect. And of course, we, we can't argue, we're getting it free of charge. So yeah, sure, great. 
So we notified the harbour authorities. They were a bit sceptical. They went public saying that we'd failed to meet our promises. It wasn't quite the case, but that was the circumstances. It was a, a business decision on their part, which I understood perfectly, and I certainly wasn't going to complain about. We were still getting a lift. However, we never discussed the detail of that coming lift beyond that conversation. And again, we just presumed that the vessel's coming in September and it would be the Calypso. We would do the move and she was away this time. Unfortunately, they were delivering a huge dry dock from a Chinese shipyard, which was twice the size of the ship that they were supposed to send. They, they couldn't even come into the harbour to offload the dry dock. They had to do it at the neighbouring island of Maui and then tow her over. So that then put us in a dilemma. They were then, they went on board the falls of flight, they went below decks, they investigated the ship and they said, yep, yeah, she's good to lift, structurally she's fine. And from a lift operator like that, who know, they know their business. That was, that was a, a good clean bill of health as far as I was concerned. But the difficulty is they said, well, you'll have to take her to Maui. Um, no, hold on, that's not something that we had planned for. We didn't have insurance in place for her going out the harbour. Um, structurally and the bow at the moment she couldn't be towed. Uh, the entrance and exit to Honolulu Harbour is a very narrow channel and if she was to founder in that channel that all of the freight and cargo that goes into Honolulu including some of the military traffic to Pearl Harbour or, or to, from the American Navy certainly would be blocked and we would be responsible. So from my perspective at a plus if we were to attempt to take her uh, across the open ocean to the next island of Maui, which is a considerable space away, she, she just wouldn't have survived. Coast Guard advised us that she wouldn't make it and they advised against it. The Marine Tugs people advised us against it. The Pilots Association advised us against it. It was an easy decision. We cancelled the operation and said, no, we're not going to do it. It's too risky. There's not enough preparation being done then for that kind of move. So that's why that particular move didn't happen. But what we did realise was that the journey home itself, that we could actually try and monetize that. And that, that was where the potential funding for um, the, the rebuild was intended to come from. Now, we had a, a second lift attempt because that was in by Seven Star, a Dutch company who again offered the support with very favourable terms, which we were happy with. But then there were issues in Honolulu around harbours releasing the ship and also preparation work that should have been done to the ship before she was supposed to leave that wasn't done. So again, I made a decision, let's cancel it because the lift ship from Seven Star was leaving Sydney, Australia and was heading up to Hawaii to collect the Falls of Clyde. The Falls of Clyde wasn't ready. We weren't in control of her and we had no clear indication that we could take her if that lift ship turned up. So we would have had the financial penalties. So for the second time, I, I made the call, not doing it. It's it, Financially, it's too much of a risk. It would cause us, cost us millions of pounds if that happened and we couldn't afford to do that. So that then passed us by. We then tried to work with Harbour's department to say, look, why don't we work together? Because if you try and dispose of the ship, you're going to have to pay money, a lot of money to tugs, insurance, people to come in and clean the ship out for scuttling. The Coast Guard will need to be satisfied and oversee the operation. The Environmental Protection Agency will need to oversee the operation. Um, the National Park Service will have to give you permission to dispose of a national listed landmark. The list goes on. So surely it makes more sense to work together. L let's split the cost 50-50 or, or, or an example like that. That was our offer as a first offer. Um, out the box and it was rejected. It was rejected. No, nope, not going to do it. Um, instead, we're going to proceed and we're going to auction the ship for disposal. Now, that was February. I've lost track of time now because of COVID. I think that was 18, 19, 18. Yeah. So they put the ship up for auction. And because we knew that all of that work would have to be done and how costly that would be, it wouldn't matter if it wasn't us wanting the ship or someone else wanted it. Even to break the ship as a breaker there on land, which they can get permission to do from the army, apparently, um, they still have to satisfy all that criteria and it would cost them still 
more money than the ship was worth in scrap. So we didn't bid on that occasion deliberately. Uh, and funny enough, the only bidder was uh, Mr. Vladimir Putin, who bid a dollar. Uh, that was that was refused because they didn't provide insurance. But additionally, Harbour Department actually put a wreck removal bond on the ship of one and a half million dollars. Now, obviously, we have no experience of what bonds are, but we have a, a contact now and a team in Houston um, from the insurance sector in particular, Mr. Travis Middleton. I think he's maybe on here today, possibly. Um, Travis then acted as the middleman for us, and he then became the new fresh face talking to the harbour's department. But the long and short of it was that they were still insisting on a bond, and that bond, well, we wouldn't need to pay one and a half million up front. We probably would still need to pay somewhere in the region of half a million before we even got the ship out of Honolulu. So when money's tight and we haven't attracted all the sponsors yet, and we've got a free lift, potentially, you know, that was a difficult situation to be in. So we didn't bid. The auction came and went. Nobody bid. Harbour's department are still, they're still, they've impounded the ship. They've still got her. Um, so it's then their dilemma of how to get rid of her. So then COVID has come past nearly a year and a half now, globally, effect of uh, COVID's been felt. And nobody can travel. We couldn't have the journey home as we intended on that route map. And the way we were planning to do it was there was a company from Doncaster that we engaged and they put together a marketing plan to sell um, sales space on the ship where we would rig up fake sales. It wouldn't be real sales. It would be a very fine mesh that could be printed with company logos. Um, the famous rigger, Jamie White, he's part of our um, advisory team at the moment. Jamie and Steve Hyman and many others, Kurt Voss, um, have been advising us on the way forward with the Falls of Clyde, not only now, but into the future as we do the rebuild. But Jamie has been looking at how would we rig up temporarily on the remaining lower stumps of the mass that are still on the ship, triangular, lightweight sails that we could put brand logos on. We could also brand the ship. And as you see, we could put brand names on the deck. Now, that came around simply because when we were talking to Hawaiian TV networks and we asked if the Falls of Clyde was leaving and there was a, a themed Scottish Hawaiian event, bagpipes and food, hula dancers and Hawaiian blessing and the governor's saying a farewell speech, would that be broadcast on TV? And they said, yes. I says, well, could you give me an idea of what kind of reach that would have? He says, oh, wow. He says, well, you're talking about 50 million. Uh, on Hawaii. And he says, no, 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 no. He says, you have to understand, we're syndicated across all of the United States to CBS, CNN, all the big networks take anything like this that we produce in particular. I went, right, okay. So 50 million would be the figure. I says, how often would that be broadcast? He says, oh, every half hour. Okay, so then you add up all those 50 millions every half hour, where potentially, and it's potential viewing audience increases dramatically. Um, so then he said, but of course, don't forget about Asia. Because we have a large Asian population, we're syndicated to all of the Chinese networks, to the Australian networks, and the Japanese networks, and Indian also. That then pushes the viewing element of the opportunity to sell brand marketing on the ship. So what we've been looking at was companies that have ethical policy, policies, um, they, they support clean emissions, they support cleaning the oceans, they support uh, reducing emissions and shipping and cars globally. And these are the kind of brands that we were hoping ethically to, to attract. Um, but as I said, then COVID has come along. So we cannot have the, the, the local events that we had planned. Now those events were aimed, uh, for instance, San Diego was the San Diego Maritime Museum. The ship would come in on a lift ship, moor nearby, the public would have access to the viewing gallery on the lift ship, but equally we would hold an event within the museum, which they would get the benefit of funding from. All we would be doing is selling the story of the Falls of Clyde, and yes, we would be looking for donations to our project as well and offering merchandise, but the main benefit would be to the museums, that they would get increased footfall on an event that day, which the media would take an interest in as well, so that each city the ship came into the sails go up, and when she leaves, they come down for safe transportation. So that was the plan, but 
During COVID, we're faced with travel restrictions. You can't, you can't fly to America. You can't fly to Hawaii. Um, in some of these cities, you can't hold public events still. And at the moment, while things are improving, that's why we have now started knocking on doors again to say, can we revisit this? Can we now move forward? So after the journey home, whether it be point A to point B, which might still have to happen that way um, because of COVID, if the bit in between is still restricted, um, we still have to come through the Panama Canal. We were tentatively offered Panama Canal, Canal Passage free of charge a number of years ago for the lift ship, bringing the falls home. Um, we are trying to revisit that to see if they will um, honour that offer from a couple of years ago. Um, but if we get the ship back to the UK, obviously, going back to the beginning of this presentation, when we started to look at the, the how, what, the why and the where, I also looked at, well, where is she going to go? Where can we put her? And what are the local regulations here? What do Peel ports as the River Authority on the Clyde need? What insurances do we need? What bonds do they need? Who are the tub companies? Who are the maintenance repair companies? Who are the maritime companies? So we've done all that four years ago, all that research and all that work. And again, recently, we've re-engaged with Peels to say that we're now looking at starting the obligation again. Um, that this time actually has got a bit more support because what one thing we did do with the ship, because she has a joint US, um, Scottish and British heritage, is we offered future places on board to serving members of the United States Navy and to the Royal Navy. Now, the idea came from the Help for Heroes campaign. And we thought, when I was, I seen a, a program one night about it, and I thought, why do these guys who are serving their country have to wait until they lose a limb or lose their mind through serving the country. Wouldn't it be great if we could offer the opportunity for the commander of a nuclear submarine or a carrier or a frigate to stand on the deck of the Falls of Clyde and actually command her just for a short period of time or to climb the sails in a real sailing tradition. And that then brings together the element of American Scottish history because John Paul Jones was the founder of the American Navy, which is a Scotsman. Um, that American, uh, the, the Scottish, British builder of the ship, and uh, spending all of her life practically in the United States. Um, that was a no brainer. And I then got a call from, <clears throat> excuse me, Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Michael J. Gilday. He's still currently in that post. He's the top man in the United States Navy. I'm not going to do his accent. But, um, he just said, excuse me, sir, can you tell me what this project's about? And I explained, as I just did to you guys just now. And he said, fantastic. He says, I love the sound of this. Keep me posted. Let me know how it develops. And as you, as you go forward, if you need any help, let me know. So that was fantastic. So we then went to the Royal Navy, um, speaking to the, I can't remember, Chris, Chris Smith, I think his name is. He's the head of the Royal Navy for Devolved Nations in Scotland. Um, he, I believe, is an admiral currently with the Royal Navy. And he then put us in touch with various other people in the Navy. But that then led to a further episode where if you look at the dry docks on the left, which are governed dry docks, there are three dry docks there. One of them at the moment is being recommissioned, but there are two left. Now, we were involved with the management company that owns that site. Um, we are not part of the group at the moment on dock one that's being trans uh, trans transformed into an operational dock. The Queen Mary, I believe, and the, and the Waverley are going to be using that exclusively, apparently. Um, but the other two dry docks are open for another vessel of some sort. So obviously, me and the owner have agreed, look, we will talk again in the future as we move forward and as what their progress is as well. Um, so what we did in light of the Royal Navy element and that shipyard, that dry dock element is only about half a mile from BAE Systems shipyard where they're building the latest Royal Navy warships and where they built the aircraft carriers in the last 10 years. So we then looked to think, is there an opportunity where we could find also another exhibit which could be a Royal Navy warship? So cut a long story short, we are having dialogue at the moment with the Royal Navy, with the MOD, the Home Office, and an overseas government around a former Royal Navy warship coming back to the Clyde 
to potentially sit in one of those dry docks also, because that then creates a large heritage site in the centre of Glasgow, where there would be at least four vessels that were all built in the Clyde, um, with room potentially for others to join at a later date, creating a massive tourism opportunity for Glasgow. Um, on the right hand side is the harbour at Inverclyde in Greenock. This is only about a mile or so from where the Falls of Clyde was built, further down river, about 12 miles from where the Govan docks are, down at the mouth of the Clyde. Um, the, where you see the trail or the wake of the little boat going in, that harbour there to the left and the dock line along in front of you is where we envisage um, setting up an incubator or a visitor village. Now the idea of the visitor village is because both these sites are protected for heritage, we can't build buildings, we can't dig up foundations, we can't do things like that. So what we're looking at is a variety of prefabricated buildings that, that can be um, assembled on site. It's been estimated and confirmed by the Strathclyde University Research and by Clyde Maritime Trust, Mr Frank Brown, who is no longer with them, he's retired now, but Frank estimated that the Falls of Clyde, sitting in Greenock, for instance, should attract in the region of 200,000 visitors per annum. Um, the rebuild and the quayside operations we expect could create jobs, as you see. We are looking to create a, a Clyde Shipbuilding Heritage Museum covering all of the Clyde, Upper and Lower Clyde. And for those of you that are not aware, it's split into two elements, the, north, the, the, the east and west, if you like. Um, incubator units, which is a situation where we're going to offer young entrepreneurs who are finding it difficult to set up a business, we're going to give them the accommodation space free of charge for 12 months to put their business idea into practice. Um, there will probably at least be six of those units offered. Uh, we will be offering a retrofitting service of the clean emission technologies. Now the companies earlier that we spoke, I mentioned that, that a prerequisite that we put to them is that under license, we want to be able to offer installation of the clean emission and other technologies that are being put into the Falls of Clyde. We want to offer them into the wider commercial market, to smaller vessels from new propulsion or even the solar element, whatever technology we use there. Um, we will have a skills training center as the idea on old skills such as welding from iron to steel um, or replating the hull entirely from steel or a mix of steel and iron. That's up to the naval architect to decide. Again, I'm not qualified. And while it's heritage is important here, putting it back to sea safely is more important at the moment. So we will rely on the engineers and the naval architects to tell us what's best. Um, we mentioned the cargo element earlier. We are looking to create a fair, a fair trade cargo hub where the cargoes would be offloaded from um, the US and the Caribbean and Africa and South America. It would then be distributed either around Scotland and Europe, but also in Glasgow and, and the rest of Scotland by electric vehicles. Um, there's so much more there that I could go on to, but as you see, what we're keen on is community opportunities from an entrepreneurial perspective, but we're offering members of the communities, local communities, and both these communities have been quite hard hit over the last 20, 30 years, unemployment is a bit high. We want to offer communities an opportunity by asking them or offering them the opportunity to sail on the Falls of Clyde on a global journey. But in order to qualify for that, we're asking them to volunteer in the local community for 12 months. They, they will then work with a third party organization or a third sector group who will then monitor and help them find a voluntary role and then they will report to us at the end of, or during the progress actually, but also at the end of the 12 months, and then we will make selections on who will qualify, and they will then go onto a list that when the Falls of Clyde starts sailing, a certain element of that list will be offered places on board, it won't cost them a penny. All they'll have to do is find their own equipment, their own materials and some funding, which they, there will be a general funding pot arranged from public funding to help communities communities like that. So that's the extensive range of what we're planning to do with the ship once she's back. So either of these two, we actually have two other areas that are fallback positions if anything goes wrong, but at the moment they are just that planned fallback. 
um, with pre-applications and interest exploited with, with local authorities and management. The main river authority is aware of what we're trying to do. Um, we have acknowledged that we will comply with the requirements and that we have demonstrated that we have professional organisations on board supporting us, that they will deal with them, not us. So they don't have to worry about a bunch of, a bunch of enthusiasts doing this, bringing a ship into a harbour recklessly or whatever. This will be handled by major organisations. Um, two of the companies that are working with us at the moment are holders offshore from Aberdeen with extensive experience in offshore operations, salvage, logistics. Um, we were dealing with the Malin Group previously. Um, we're hoping they might still have an interest um, because, our pro because our timeline stretched a bit. They obviously went back to other things, but that's for them to decide. The other company is Peralco um, in the offshore sector again, who have been a, a great guide with regards to international agreements and regulations and what we have to do to make this happen. And within each city, Travis Middleton, what we have to do each harbour we stop at, if we're doing that, um, what our liabilities will be. So it's not just a little gang of enthusiasts who like old ships and the Clyde and Tartan shortbread. This is a serious project that has been thoroughly evaluated at the highest level with the highest degree of engineering skills. Strathclyde University, um, BAE Systems, and the other companies that are mentioned. Um, we're looking for more support. Um, we've been offered lots of in-kind support. Much of it, I have to say, once the ship is back in the UK, that is our difficulty and we're trying to overcome that. But we put the request out, and I'm doing it again now, to many companies in the UK, the Europe, around the world, if you want to be involved in this project, please just drop us a line. Um, intermittently, you'll see our web page, um, and I can be contacted uh, through our website. Um, so that's that's the shore-based element of what we're trying to do. This is an example of the type of units that we'll look to set up. They're prefabricated, they're made from former containers, the glass fronted, as you see there, and we're looking for retail, food, merchandise, river cloud storage, you know, the list is endless, really. But this gives us the flexibility to populate a site some of them, as I said, will be um, incubator units. Um, the interesting part about the sh future ship operations is that we anticipate that it could bring into the local economy up to and probably beyond 12 million pounds per annum. Now in an area, both of them, that are suffering quite badly from global recessions um, and other domestic issues going back many years, um, that's quite an injection of cash into the local economy and trade and business and tourism. They all come together, education, skills, training, opportunities for entrepreneurs to have the confidence to come forward, come into our site and be part of it. So as you see, we're trying to not only be a ship, but to be an engineering, to be um, a heritage, to be um, an entrepreneurial supporting business. And we have to be a business here. We can't run, we are a community, we will be a community interest company, but we can't run this only as a small charity with a little group of volunteers. We have to engage major companies here and that involves professional contracts and we need that support to, to guide us um, and to make sure we don't get it wrong. So as I said, these are the buildings, there's the email address, sorry, the website there at the bottom, uh, traditionalnow.scot email address. Um, open to other ideas if anybody else has got some suggestions on prefabricated temporary type units that we could put on the site. These are what we came up with. They offer viewing platforms, which we think is great. The glass element uh, gives visibility and openness and brightness, um, even within a heritage environment. It's modern, it's clean. And winding up, uh, you know, this little poem comes to mind. Um, many ask why this ship, and we were asked that question many times, particularly by Mr. Guy Platten, head of the British Chambers of Shipping. He says, why should we help you? Why this ship? And I said, this ship bears the name of our great river, a river that built the maritime nation that we became. It starts near the Falls of Clyde, near Lanark, through to the heart of Empire, Glasgow, down to the sea at the Lower Clyde where many men grafted and toiled and many died 
to build these great ships. For what? What's left to remember them? We speak of heritage, and here it is in all its amazing, amazing glory. What it is with those descendants of those ships that, and those people that built these great ships that we say, this is why this ship falls of Clyde.